Hello, in this video, I'm gonna go through lesson 4.2 on applications of linear equations. Our essential question for today is, how do you use linear equations to solve real world problems? We're going to look at two different types of problems today. Our first problem involves hexagonal tables. So let's start by reading the description here. Imagine you're preparing a banquet and you don't know how many guests are coming. You must prepare for any possible number of people. You only have hexagon tables and six people sit at one table. So one table, six people. But if we need to add additional tables for more guests, those must be placed end to end along a narrow aisle. So here's a picture of three hexagonal tables pushed together. And you'll notice now that when I start pushing the tables together, no longer do we have six people at a table because every time we push the sides together, we lose these seats right here. So what we're gonna try to do is come up with a bit of a pattern here. And we have a table included right here in our packet. Notice that one table, if it's just one table, we have all six seats. But now let's look at two tables. So for two tables, let's look at just this section. And remember that if I look at just two tables, I would also have a person right here. So if you go through and you count the number of smiley faces, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people. And then for three, that's if I look at the whole table in my picture now, you'll notice that there's 14. And one pattern that might stick out to you is every time we add a table, we get an extra two chairs on each side. So I'm adding four chairs each time. Remember, I'm not counting the ends because those are pushed together. So let's extend the pattern a little bit. If three tables have 14, you can see that each time it's just going up by four. Six plus four is 10, 10 plus four is 14. So if I extend that pattern, I would have 14 plus four, so 18 people at four tables. Five tables, we would have another four people. So 18 plus four, we're up to 22. And then add four again for six tables. And now we are up to um, 26. Notice now though with the eight, I skipped a number here. So I'm not gonna add four tables this time. To get from six to eight, I'm going up by two tables. So you could think of it as we have four per table and we're adding two more tables. So I'm actually going up by eight and 26 plus eight is 34. From eight to 10, we have a similar thing going on. From eight to 10, that's another two tables and each table has four people. So we have four times two, that's up by eight again. And if we do 34 plus eight, that's 42. Let's try the 20 now. From 10 to 20, we just went up by 10 tables. So if we add an additional 10 tables and each table is four, you really have 10 times four. We're going up by 40. So that's 82 people at 20 tables. Now that we've come up with the pattern, the next thing we're going to do is graph these points and see if we can use that to help us figure out an equation. I do want to extend this pattern back one more. So let's suppose we go back to zero. So if I have zero tables, if I extend the pattern, think about what number would have to be right here so that when I add four to it, I get up to six. Well, six minus four is two. So if we extend this pattern, if there are zero tables, that would fit two people. Now that doesn't make sense here in the context of the problem, but we're going to need that number two to help us come up with the equation. And we'll do that shortly. Now that we have our table completed for number one, let's go ahead and look at what these points look like if we graph them. The x axis, remember, is the one that goes across from left to right. So here's my x axis, that's my number of tables. My y axis goes straight up and down like this. For the x's, we need to go from zero up to 20. And there's actually 20 numbers right here on the table. So if you just wanna number those one to 20, Let's do that quick. So there we go, I numbered the x-axis. Now our y's, we're gonna have to be a little more careful here because the y has to go all the way from two up to 82. 
So counting by ones isn't going to work. Let's go ahead and count by fives on our y-axis. That way we'll be able to get up past 80. All right, so I numbered up to 85. That's gonna be enough to get all my points. And now I'm just gonna put a dot at each point. Remember in our table when we had zero, two that we added? Let's plot that point here first. So zero, two would be right about there. And then we had one, six. So going just a little past the five. We have two, 10, which would put us right here. Whoops, 210, let's go right on the line. So 1, 6, 210, here we go. Then three tables was 14 people. Four tables was 18, so just a little bit before the 20. Five tables was 22. And six tables was 26 people. We have 8 and 34 from our chart, so that would be put us here. And then 10, 42 would be right about here, and then 2082. And hopefully as you look at your points, you notice that the points make a line. This is a linear equation because every time we add a table, it goes up by four. We have a constant rate of change. So if I connect these points now with the straight edge here, whoopsie, sorry, my tool's not working. Let's try this again. Straight line, okay. There we go, that looks pretty good. You'll notice that your points all fall on a line. So we have a linear equation. And the next thing we're going to look at here in number three is we're going to come up with an equation in the form y equals mx plus b. Let's look at the slope. The slope is the rate of change. So think about what happens every time you add a table. The rate of change. Well, the rate of change is 4. My slope is 4 because every time I add a table, it goes up by 4. The y-intercept is where it starts. Remember from 4.1, the y-intercept is always 0 and then a number. Well, if we go back to our table, the number you'll find is 0, 2. So our y-intercept is 2. And now, using that slope and y-intercept, we should be able to write an equation in the form y equal mx plus b. The slope is m, so 4. So I'm going to put a 4 right there, y equal 4x. And then the b is my y-intercept, that's 2. So the equation that represents the number of people that can sit at x tables is y equals 4x plus 2. Let's just test out our equation quick to make sure it works. Remember before when we did the table, how we said if there was eight tables, that was 34 people. Let's just test that out quick. So if x equals eight tables, let's take our equation and put eight in there. So four times eight plus two. If we do the math on that, four times eight is 32. 32 plus two is 34. And that's exactly what we calculated in our table. If we have 20 guests, 20 tables, excuse me, x is 20, let's test that as well. So four times 20, add two. And if I do the math here, that's 80 plus two, that's 82, which is exactly what we had before. So the equation is really helpful because now if I ask you how many guests could fit at 55 tables, you wouldn't need to make a big giant table. You could just put 55 in place of x and then solve for y by doing four times 55 plus two. So the equation makes it a lot easier to extend the pattern well beyond the numbers that you used to come up with the formula. Our equation from number four was written in terms of y. For five here, we want to express the equation if you know the number of guests y attending the banquet and you're trying to determine the number of tables x that you should order. Recall that our equation was y equals 4x plus 2. But that's solved for y. We want to solve the equation for x, which means let's get the x by itself. So I'm going to do a little rearranging here, and I'm going to start by moving that plus 2 to the other side of the equal sign. When we move things from one side to the other, we do the opposite. So to undo the plus 2, I'm subtracting 2 on each side. And now I'm one step away from my answer. 
If we divide each side by four, that will undo the four in front of the X and make sure that you're taking all of the things and dividing them by four. So now the four over four cancels and I'm left with Y divided by four minus two divided by four equals X. And I'm gonna clean this up just a little bit. I'm gonna put X on the left side, then Y divided by four. And then for two over four, we can actually reduce that to one half. So I'm gonna rewrite that as X equals Y divided by four minus a half. And now that equation is nice because if I asked you how many um, tables would I need? If I know that a hundred guests are attending or something like that, now I could take the number of guests Y and I could put that in here and say, okay, X equals a hundred divided by four minus a half. And I would do my math, 25 minus a half, 24 and a half. Now in this case, obviously we can't have half of a table. So if you need 24 and a half tables, you're gonna need the 24th table plus one more table, which means I would need 25 tables for 100 guests. So solving the equation for X lets us solve some different types of questions. Let's extend this problem now to looking at a different shape of a table. Let's suppose that instead of hexagon tables, what if you have triangle tables? For a triangle table, if we have just one table, you can have three people at the seats. If you push two together, we'll follow the same pattern where they go end to end. So two tables looks like it is four seats. Let's try three tables. So I'm gonna put three triangles together one seat, two seats, three seats, four seats, five seats. So you can see a pattern again with the triangle table. Each time it's going up by one. Okay, now if I was to go back to the zero table, because that's gonna help me with my y-intercept, think about if you go back by one, that would be two. So there's my y-intercept, there's my b, and if I think y equals mx plus b, m is the rate of change, which is one, and b is the y-intercept, which is that two. So our equation for triangle tables would be y equal one x plus two. What if we look at square tables? Let's see if we can come up with a pattern again. One square table, I have all four seats. If I have two tables pushed together now, I have one, two, three, four, five, six. If we have three tables lined up, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's a pattern each time again, it's going up by two this time. Up by two, up by two. If we go back to the zero with table, if you subtract your two, that'll be back to two again. So that number is gonna be my y-intercept. And my slope is just my rate of change. So y equals 2x plus um, 2. And that would be your square tables. And you could extend that pattern to any type of table, really. You might notice a pattern if you look back at the hexagons. Remember, the hexagons was 4x plus 2. So when I had six sides, it was a 4x. When I had three sides, it was a 1x. And when I had four sides, it was a 2x. So maybe you might notice a pattern. Six sides was 4x, three sides was 1x, four sides was 2x. If you see that pattern, great. If you don't, that's okay. We can always just draw out the first few examples and then extend the pattern one step further. So now that we've completed our hexagon table problem, we're going to end this lesson by looking at one final type of problem, and that's a distance equals rate times time problem. You've likely seen the formula distance equals rate times time a few times before, probably in your physical science class as well. We can use this formula to set up some equations and solve some problems. Let's look at this first example. Two trains leave the station at the same time, traveling in opposite directions. 
One travels at 70 miles per hour and the other travels at 60 miles per hour. How long does it take for the distance between them to reach 390 miles? Okay, we do not know the distance of either, but I know that one train is going this way at 70 miles per hour and one train is going the other way at 60 miles an hour. Let's fill in the table with what we know. Train one, I'm gonna let be the train that is traveling at 70 miles per hour. So the rate is 70 and the time, let's just call the time T. Now for train number two, we know that it's traveling at 60 miles an hour and it's gonna travel the same amount of time because we're looking for how long does it take the distance between the two trains to be equal to 390. Well, train one, its distance is gonna be 70 times T and train two, its distance is going to be 60 times T. So we have D equals 70 T for train one and D equals 60 T for train two. Now, if they're going opposite directions and we're looking for how far apart they are, this first train is traveling a distance of 60 T. The second train is traveling a distance of 70 T. For the distance apart, we're gonna add those two distances together. And we know that if we add 70 T plus 60 T, we want them to be 390 miles apart. So there's my equation, 70 T plus 60 T equals 390. If we combine our like terms and add 70 plus 60, that's 130T equals 390. And now we're one step away. If we just divide each side by 130, we get T equals three, which means the time is in hours since the speed is in miles per hour. So that means it's going to take three hours for the two trains to be 390 miles apart. Right, and if you wanted to, you could figure out, you know, how far did train one go? Well, 70 times three is 210. How far did train two go? Well, 60 times three is um, 180. Notice that if I add those two numbers up, 210 plus 180, that adds to 390, the mileage that we were looking for. So that's a cool way that you can check your answer if you'd like. Here's one more distance equal rate times time problem, but this time, instead of traveling in opposite directions, we're going to have the vehicles travel in the same direction. Here we have a bus leaves the station at 8 a.m. and averages 30 miles per hour. So bus one has a rate of 30 miles per hour. I'm gonna put a 30 right there for the rate. Another bus leaves the station following the same route two hours after the first bus leaves. So let's call the first bus T for the time and the second bus is leaving two hours after the first bus. So their time is going to be less than the first bus, two hours less than the first bus. So that's T minus two. And the second bus is traveling at 50 miles per hour. Okay, now you could also of course do the problem another way and you could say if the first bus is traveling at, or sorry, if the second bus was traveling at time T, you could also do the first bus would have that two extra hours, so it would be T plus two. That would also work. The idea though is that the second bus isn't on the road as long because they're leaving two hours later. So their total time driving at that 50 miles per hour is two hours less than bus one. So whether I do T and T minus two, whoops, or T plus two and T, I'm still going to get the same answer. I'm just gonna go back to what I had originally. And we wanna know, um, excuse me, when will the second bus catch up to the first bus? So let's picture it this way. Bus one leaves, they go so far. Bus two leaves a little bit later. I want to know when are the two buses going to meet? When are they going to cross the same path? Right, and technically I guess they left from the same point, so maybe my line should be more like this. But when will they be equal? So our distances have to be equal. So we want the 30T, 
which is the first bus, right? The first bus is distance equals 30 times t, so d equals 30t. And the second bus is d equals 50 times t minus 2. We want those distances to be equal so that the buses catch up to one another. So with this idea in mind, rather than adding them up like we did when they were moving separate directions, we want the distances to be equal so that the two buses end up at the same place, meaning they've gone the same distance total. So let's set those two things equal to each other. 30t has to be equal to 50 times t minus 2. And now we can do our algebra here. Let's distribute. So 50 times t is 50t. 50 times negative 2 is negative 100. And let's go ahead and solve for t. I want to move all my t's to the same side of the equal sign. So I'm going to subtract this 50t on both sides. Remember, you can draw a line to help you keep your sides of your equation straight. If I subtract 50 on the right side, I have to subtract 50 on the left side. And now I have negative 20t equals negative 100. And I'm one step away now from my answer. Let's just divide by negative 20. And when we do that, we get t equals 5. So it is going to be, you know, 5 total hours. Now remember, that total hours was for bus 1. Because bus 1 was the t. So let's go ahead and figure out what time it would be. So bus 1 left the station at 8 a.m. If we take 8 a.m. and we add 5 hours to that, if you count that out, that would be 9 o'clock is 1 hour, 10 o'clock is 2 hours, 11 o'clock is 3 hours, 12 o'clock is 4 hours, and 5 hours would be 1 o'clock. So at 1 p.m., the two buses will catch each other and they'll be at the same spot. And that concludes Lesson 4.2. Thanks for watching. Bye.